please a warm welcome for Bob Weissman. Over to you, Thanks, sir. Jeff. Make sure the clicker works. All right, great. Delighted to uh, be here. See, no, next. Okay, good. This is just the abstract. You've already seen that. Um, personally, what happens is I've been on the client side for 30 years. I was a member of government, uh, mainly in defense, uh, for that. After that, I was 10 years over at CGI, where I started the EA practice and insisted we start using open standards and the TOGAF, and this was back in 2004. So I'm a long-term uh, supporter of open standards, and some of the lessons learned might drive that home okay, for you now. Most of my time now is spent uh, doing pro bono work, uh, working with the, uh, in the university, educating the people, uh, as they say in French, dans le berceau, in the cradle. Okay, so we get the young students, we get them thinking enterprise architecture from the get-go. So I'll just give you a quick introduction. I'll come to you from some lessons learned. Now we're trying to distill 40 years worth of experience into about 40 minutes. So as a consequence, I'll do my best to uh, be fairly uh, short and come up with some concluding material for that. Now we'll take a look at the issues. Uh, we've been working now in electronic government. I have uh, certainly since 1979. Okay, so this is nothing new. Yet in 2012, we basically ended up having systems where 55,000 Canadian seniors, for example, did not receive their public pension. You know, the public service basically responded, well, they didn't apply. People were living in poverty. We have to change the way of service delivery. In 2016, we have a, a pay system in Canada uh, that will replace one that was actually working or place several that was actually working, 80,000 public servants, 1,100 had to leave because they weren't paid for eight months. I mean, why are we still having these problems after more than 20 years of government transformation? And I think that is one of the issues that we really have to address when we're taking a look at saying is, why are we still having the same problems? Okay, for that. And, you know, why? Government knew what age the citizens were, and the government knew exactly who works where at what level. So there's somewhere still a mix-up with between the business needs and also getting the technology fielded. It's more than just fielding technology, it has to work. Let's take a look. What is enterprise architecture? There are lots of definitions of EA out there. Uh, for me, I just simply say, take much more of a business bent to it. It's explicit knowledge, an explicit knowledge of the enterprise context, assets, their relationships and their evolution over time. It's essentially rigorous planning. And when I talk to the business people, I say, this is, a, this is not an IT paradigm. This is a digitizing the enterprise paradigm, but it's just business planning. I used it when I was in portfolio management, I used enterprise architecture as a tool. We didn't have an enterprise architecture cell, we just called it a strategic direction, where planning and architecture-based decision-making were basically combined. Okay, for that. And that was back in the 1990s. Okay, now the context and technology continuously change. You have to handle it. It's not a big problem if you plan for it. Okay, for that. And government context, and this is one thing that a lot of the enterprise architects don't get, is that includes politics and legislation. Often when you're doing e-government, you're gonna have to change legislation. So you just have to take that into account. It's not a big deal. That's why governments are there. And as the, the, the mayor of, deputy mayor of Paris alluded to, is that you have to change the organizational structure of the government sometimes to accommodate digitization. So it, you have to take a look at the enterprise from end to end when you're talking about digital government, okay, for that. So it's a question of handling it. Now let's talk about EA. A lot of people talk about EA. You've got to understand the three main, main EA deliverables are where the organization is, where the organization where the organization is going to, and where the, you know, and how they get there. If those three elements aren't present in an enterprise architecture, it's incomplete. I find a lot of people worry about one aspect of that particular one, namely the baseline or the target, and they forget about the other pieces. This is just planning 101, okay, for that. And successfully guessing, you know, all EA is about business transformation. And when you're dealing with electronic government, you are transforming the way that the government's moving forward. All of these slides, by the way, will be of AR, should already be posted to the conference website, okay, for that. Now, lesson one I really, really want to emphasize is don't frame business problems as IT problems. What I've often seen is that they want to solve, 
they had a business issue and they said, well, let's let the IT guys handle it. Uh, we had one example, uh, for example, in human resources where they wanted to integrate several hundred systems and they said, fine, we'll just use one application. So they tried to solve it at the IT folks. Every department and ministry modified the application so that there was no information interoperability between them. So the actual gain and the modification of the particular system didn't solve the problem. And that's one reason you need to take a look at the whole thing. And you know, there's no, now no business service process does not use IT. You need to rewrite the book. We were working in defense when we realized about digitizing, um, and I don't want to sound bellicose, but you know, the, the digitizing the battle space, we had to take a look at not, not new legislation, but we had to take a look at completely writing all the doctrine, every business processes. The forces had to reorganize. That's part of the driver for joint staff, joint forces. Because we were trying to get away from all the differentiation. We had to transform the entire enterprise. It wasn't just throwing IT at it. And a lot of the broad times, you also have, like in modernizing service Canadians, where the, dev, you know, the, the associate deputy minister said, if we need to change legislation, let us know. And we said, fine. But invariably, the IT guy said, oh, we can't change legislation. The people started retreating back and, you know, very cautious, okay, for that. And that's one reason it's important that we put that in the TOGAP 9.1 to think in terms of capabilities, in terms of delivering business value. The other thing is, you don't want to deliver it one fell swoop, you want to deliver it incrementally. So you take about chunking it out in capability increments. Now, from an IT and engineering perspective, I can guarantee you this is not the most efficient way of delivering. But you know what? It's the most effective way. And when you're taking a look at all these capability increments and capabilities, you always take a look at the people, okay, per process, and you take a look at the material dimension. This, by the way, came out of government. We put it into TOGAF 9. Okay, that was one of the reasons. We wanted people to take a look at the whole thing. Now, from a software engineering perspective, you always had people process technology. But people didn't practice it. Or they were doing it at the micro level rather than at the macro level. You want to make sure that enterprise architecture is used appropriately. Some, the documentation still reads, and I have trouble when I'm finding document, you, you know, finding business value. They're always talking about reducing the, I, the information and communications and technology spend. That's not why you do enterprise architecture. It's a transformational. You have to judge it on the value that it brings to the business. And that is one of the really important aspects that you have to focus on. And when you're talking about creating digital government, you're in integrating management technology and knowledge management. So these are the things that enterprise architecture brings to the table. So when you're using EA, don't just use it, I want to reduce the amount of money I spend on ICT. That's not the reason you do it. It might be a byproduct, an outcome, but that's not the reason you do it. You're dealing with the uh, e-government. You want to create, and this comes out of Jeannie Ross's book, um, you know, Enterprise Architecture Strategy. What you want to do is have strategic initiatives, and you want to use enterprise architecture as a way of validating that the strategic initiatives are feasible. And that is a very foundation role. Essentially, EA becomes a rigorous planning, confirmatory planning for, you want to do this? How are you going to do it? What are the implications of it? It's a more detailed form of planning. And then you come out with your engagement model, and then you come out with your foundation for execution. I would recommend that this, the, the, the Jeannie Ross um, uh, book, a lot of the stuff in there was written about 2006 or seven. Uh, that still contains a lot of seminal equipment, uh, seminal information, okay, for enterprise architecture. But this is the way you really want to take a look at enterprise architecture, where it's an integral part of the enterprise building and strategy, uh, planning and strategy, okay, for that. Integrative thinking, Roger Martin, the meta skill of being able to face and take two models and integrate them together, okay, for that. Now, now, okay. What you're trying to do is take a look at various concepts and put them together. Because often, one model will not suit. That's one reason, for example, let's take a look at TOGAF. Often you have to customize it or integrate it with other models to, to, to make it worthwhile for the particular uh, client situation. And in EA, in government, you need better model for each government's needs. I'm working with smart cities. They don't have the same concerns as the federal or provincial governments or state governments. 
So what happens is you can't use templated solutions. Often you have to take multiple, temp multiple frameworks, put them together so that it suits the needs of the client. It's called integrative thinking. A lot of people are still, when they're doing enterprise architecture, where's the template? Fill in a template, and away they go. That's not the way things work, okay, for that. Um, one of the other things and lessons learned that I've, I find particularly important are mindsets. Now, when you're looking at the business literature, a lot of it basically deals with how people think, how people approach things. And they come up with two different mindsets. One is called reliability, and the other one's called validity. Let's take a look at the differences for them. Managers, they exploit the status quo. Those are the people that take an existing business model and essentially make it work really well. When you're dealing with, you know, it's consistent and predictable, and you're dealing with algorithmic type of reasoning, you're dealing with persistence of the past, okay, you're dealing with, okay, you want to eliminate bias. Oh, it's extrapolations of big data and the like. And those people need facts. They need boards that said, well, this worked in 1925, this works here, and this works here, and so what happens is we need something here. They're the ones that are going to make your existing business really work well. But the thing is, you also need people that are leaders. And what happens is you're not just managers exploiting, you're not exploiting the status quo, you're creating a new status quo. You want to innovate. And you want to take a look at outcomes, okay, for that. You want to take a look at people that are generally heuristic, rules of thumb, ways of looking at things much more flexibly. Oh, by the way, this comes out of the body of knowledge of business design, okay, for that. And you also want to take a look at breaking with the past. You want to make a change. Now, when you're dealing with the government, you're having a, this is really transformational. And what happens is what worked in the past is not necessarily relevant to what's going to work in the future, okay, for that. And a lot of the times what happens is you have to be able to accept risk. Most of the people that are reliability based, guess what? They don't like risk and they will not accept it. Whereas when you're dealing with people that are the validity based, they're basically generally much more, will manage it. C'est la vie. I mean, you just basically carry on. There's risk walking across the street, especially here in Paris, okay, for that. And what happens is they deal with intuitive skills. So these are two different mindsets. Now, where do you think, what do you think that most governments have in abundance? They have the reliability mindset. That causes problems. They will let the existing, the existing business. Now, if you've got everybody with a reliability mindset and you're trying to pitch the government and get it working, it's going to be very difficult. What you need is a team, because the validity people, they'll think the wheels will fall off if you're not careful. You need a group that basically both combined of reliability and validity mindsets. We were pitching new e-government concepts to a group of people at the uh, assistant deputy minister level, and those were the decision makers, senior executives, and what? guess what? Every one of them around the table were reliability mindset, and they said, no, this is too, too much of a change. We wanted to go to life event based, you know, for example, what the deputy mayor was saying from Paris, life event based uh, planning rather than always program planning and pull, uh, planning and modernizing service. They wouldn't have anything to do with it because they were worried about the risk, which is definitely there. Now, where is enterprise architecture? In the management side of the house, you've got the reliability mindset. Okay, you've got analytical insights or data rich. They're basically exploiters and they're dealing for perfection. They're going to go Six Sigma and they're going to grind all those products into the ground. And then basically they're very risk averse. Okay? The leaderships, the leaders are going to be validity mindset. They're going to be dealing with intuitive insights. You won't, it's not necessarily an extrapolation of saying this is a new possibility for the future. And you're data poor and you're dealing with outliers. They're explorers, they're innovators. Okay, for that. They said risk, you're going to manage. Now, and they're also used to dealing in a much more descriptive environment. Not learning by rote, what happens, they'll say is, well, we'll handle these things. It's a much more heuristic way of planning. Enterprise architecture has to be right down the middle. You have to have both, because you can't go to a new state, or you, know, you need the managers to make sure that your systems are working. And I'm talking about systems in the, the big system word, okay? Whereas the leaders are gonna move it in the right direction. You need to have a combination of the two of them. Enterprise architects have to have both business design thinking, they have to have both management and leadership concerns involved in there. Then there's mind the execution gap. You've got your strategic vision, you've got the people and projects and operations. 
That happens all the time. They have a wonderful plan, and the people on the ground actually building the stuff and running it have no idea what the planners want to intend. And enterprise architecture really has to fill this operational plans and architecture space. In most cases that I've seen, they don't, execution is a major problem. They have high level architectures and they don't grind them down to the solution architectures and the solution architectures end up being disjoint. Okay, for that. So, execution, EA is not the only management framework and if management frameworks have to work in cooperation. You know, you get the guys, you're not aligned, you know, you've got the keeping the lights on, you've got the people, the unconstrained programmers that want to just, I want to build something, I can't help myself, I want to build it. Okay, you've got the CEO throwing up his hands because he has no idea what a, you know, how the plans are being operationalized. The clients are not happy people, okay, for that. And you've got the business execs and the CIO trying to play referee between all these different conflicting uh, requirements. This is not trivial, you've got to sort it out. Okay, for example. Now, in the new governance frameworks that are being put out by um, the information system, by the auditors, essentially, they differentiate governance from management. The issue with governance is often they're strategic and a little bit woolly, whereas the management people is tyranny of the immediate. They're always worried about the stuff that's going wrong. I've seen entire meetings of senior executives dissolve because the Blackberries aren't working properly that day. I mean. Guys, focus, you've got people working on that, okay, for that. And you also have to coordinate the plan, build, and run aspects. Now, enterprise architecture really has to address all of those communities, especially the plan side. That's where the enterprise architecture creates its benefits for that. Now, part of the problem is if enterprise architecture isn't there, guess who's got 90 to 95% of the budget? Operations and maintenance. So guess what? who is going to be calling the shots to people running the system, and they're worried about the tyranny of the immediate. They're not going to be your innovators. So this is one role that enterprise architecture really has to sort out in a reasonably coherent manner, okay, for that. Now, one of the ways you can do it is by at least having an integrated repository. I know I was working with, I had the pleasure of working with the Auditor General, and we were auditing uh, some of these large departments, and you, you know, What's the status of a project? Well, it depends what system you asked. And we had one project that was both green, yellow, and red in terms of deliverables. The only reason it was green is because the project manager decided to cut the scope and cut out the various elements that were needed by the other projects in the enterprise architecture, but the enterprise architecture wasn't consumable. And he said, well, it's on the book. It's on page 242 at the bottom of the page, you know, at the bottom of the page in a footnote. I said, you know, that might be given a bit more prominence. Master data management is not a trivial exercise. And if you want to share it amongst various projects, you've got to make sure that when you put it in your architecture, project managers don't all of a sudden take off and change it. Okay, for that. You want to make sure that the initiative synchronization works? We did this in the United States, is we didn't call it enterprise architecture, it was part of the IMIT plan. So we were sponsored by the deputy minister. Okay, so that was the, uh, the highest public servant in there. And what we did is we put in a, a governance framework and then we put in a project management framework. They didn't have it. And then essentially what they did is we put in like who's providing what to whom and we made sure that everything was totally integrated through the governance framework. Uh, it worked quite well. But this is where they had a department that had all of a sudden been uh, put together. It ended up being uh, a gold, they won the gold medal from the state of New York for that. So that was a, a good lesson learned. Also what happens is most projects now end up being generated bottom up. You have some person phoning a help desk and then all of a sudden before you know it, it's turned into a massive project. Okay, it's tactical projects that are being generated. What you have to do is you have to enable strategic project management. Now that does not mean that you forget about tactical project management, but you've got to integrate it governance. In a lot, in the IT field especially, they separate governance for operations and maintenance from governance for capital. So you've got people fixing a system that you want to get rid of. Okay, you can't do that. And as, when you're dealing with digital government, you really have to make sure that all of your spend is put on the table and you know what's happening. Now, I'd like to say that's abnormal, but I started my life as a civil engineer. We were doing civil engineering planning. We had the same issues, but it was integrated. Okay, so there wasn't a, we didn't have that conflict. Like in civil engineering, that was resolved. And that's one reason why I came into IT as a sort of a, a user representative. I, I just said this is chaotic. 
This is another example from Australia, where we essentially looked at where does our enterprise architecture fit? I don't expect you to read everything, but it, all I'm saying is right now we had the business level. Then what we did is, and that was business accountability, then we essentially created the business and IT architecture where we had strategic capabilities and we had the architects working with the business folks. Then when it came down to the architecture, when it came down to the architecture, you saw the colors were simply used on one page to see whose turf was where. And I hate to use the word turf as sort of an anglicism for empire, MP, whatever, this sort of thing, because everybody has their own bailiwick. Okay, and they don't want anybody playing in it. But this way we did, we took a look with the building architects and what we did is over here is that everything was linked together and essentially the implementation of migration planning, a lot of that was done by the, by the project management office or at that time was the deputy minister in charge, uh, assistant deputy minister for, uh, for delivery. They didn't call it project management, they called it delivery. This is not a bad thing to do in your preliminary planning is to figure out how all these things are done. It's important that enterprise architecture is done. It doesn't mean that the enterprise architecture cell has to do all of it. Matter of fact, it's much better. Who owned enterprise architecture here? The, the enterprise did. So when you're dealing with the government and you want to bring all these groups together, this is a good way to, uh, to basically approach it Okay, for that. Now, you've got to take a look also at the EA value proposition. The executive dilemma right now is they've got every consultancy and you know, group pitching okay, their own methodologies. And these methodologies are stovepipe. I belong to about 10 different uh, professional associations. I spend most of my time just saying, you realize that they're doing this already and these, you might want to use this and basically acting as a maven, as a coordinator. Okay, for that. It's a real problem because executives don't know which one to basically put together. And that's one reason with enterprise architecture can sort of create sort of a cohesive glue between these various frameworks. That alone is a huge value proposition. And in government especially, everybody's got their own territory. Okay, so as a consequence, you need somebody to say, this is how the territories will interact with one another. Okay, for that. Now, one of the things, too, is from you talking about the value proposition is we have to understand we're going from first generation where we essentially automated the manual processes and right now the applications are dying and the infrastructure is dead to second generation where we're actually changing the business. Most countries are in that. And you know what, There's, it's all the first generation people that are still around and they're trying to do the same things they did in first generation, not realizing the second generation requires a holistic perspective. So this is just simply, you know, 2G and all these other th expressions. This is important to understand and to bring on board, okay, for that. Now, one of the problems you have is because this is sort of, this is just an artifact from first generation IT. This is complicated. It's too complicated. And one of the enterprise architecture value propositions should be keep it simple. I got the Tower of Babel there, you know, talking about 28 different languages. You got, you got the language issue, you've got the interoperability issue. There's a simpler way of doing that. Okay, for that. Stickiness, remember lessons learned. Okay, this is, again, government is supposed to be a learning organization. They don't remember. So in 1995, in one department, we had a wonderful IM plan, which was integrated with the enterprise architecture. We had segment enterprise architectures, everything worked well. Well, 2016, all the segments were building and they didn't have enterprise interoperability because they forgot about the overarching architecture. And now what happens is all the segments are creating their own enterprise architecture with each other because they need it. I mean, this is a lesson that was learned. Why are we having to relearn it? And these are the things, and when you're pulling out artifacts from 20 years old and saying is, well, we need to do this, I just say, why don't you try this as a baseline? That's one advantage, I guess, of being old and being a pack rat, you know what I mean? You just, you just keep this stuff around, the unclassified material, and you say, I'm not gonna do it for you, you've already done it, and give it back to the clients. So it's, it's an interesting time. Now, you also wanna have rollback and release management. There was a document management. I mean, this is just simply motherhood, or it should be, there was a document management system fielded in government. And in 2014, they did an update of it. They didn't have a, they didn't have, they went straight into production with the update. And for two weeks, everybody in the department had no access to their documents. So they said afterwards, two weeks, well, we fixed it. Nobody was gonna use that again. It was back to shared files and folders because they didn't trust 
the central system okay for that pay 2016 again it's an issue uh, 80,000 out of 300,000 public servants received incorrect pay. There were probably about uh, 2,000 that were, in, that were not paid at all for eight months. A lot, 1,100 left the public service in order to pay for their daycare. Okay, for that. 720 are still without pay now as we speak. This is not a trivial problem. So as a consequence, we really have to take a look at, you've got to take a look at the lessons learned. They were learned, they're, less, they're the best practices for a reason. Uh, I don't know, we're making these mistakes again. Quality of services. I've also seen in government service level agreements, and they're not using service level agreement for shared services, and that's causing a major problem. Quality of service is not a nice to have. It's mandatory. And again, uh, in the auditing role, you end up seeing a great deal of this. Lessons learned, IT failure. Take a look at this, 1997, 61% of projects failed. Okay, well, it went down in 2001 to 50%. Guess where we're at right now, 61%. And again, it's the same old issues. Project goals and expectations, which you do in your enterprise architecture, weren't put in. Requirements were unclear. Insufficient technical knowledge. Problematic technology. I went to a, um, a paper that was written in 1986 called the PRISM Report. Some of you might remember that or not. And the failure factors were identical. I mean, this is 1986 and now it's 2016. There's something wrong with stickiness, okay, for that, uh, for that lessons learned. And also, I just want to make just a point is that innovation is not project failure. When you're doing your fail fast item, make sure that you have good ideas, but you have a place to try them out, kick the tires. Don't, if you're going to create a project, they have to build something. So make sure that the concept of the project before you create a project is works before you make it a project and fund it and get it forward. So you can innovate in the innovation facility in your sort of your sandbox, then what you do is you create a project. I, you know, like I said, I've had people, disjoint architecture at the project level, you're gonna get silos, post-implementation, integration headache. E-government, the main asset is information, okay? It's not, a, you know, and stakeholder management, for example, you gotta know what information they need in all types of forms. It's not just database data. Okay, for that. Case study information sharing, they've got 10 layers of process decompositions, mountains of enterprise architecture. The problem was the executives didn't want to share the data. Okay, and again, so you've got that cultural issue as well. Um, managing uh, service for Canadians, information-centric analysis, it's key to getting your services properly sorted out. We're going from program-based service delivery where people have to pull for programs into life event-based service delivery. This is a huge transformation, where you say this is the, this is the situation of the client. What services, multi-jurisdictional, are available to the client? And this has been proving to be a major issue because people don't have the same viewpoint of client. Uh, just trying to integrate federal government services, let alone integrate them with provincial and municipal, is a nightmare, okay, for that. This was an example of selling the information model Client-centric service delivery, where we essentially said they belong to a segment. Now remember, older people are segments. They don't have smartphones. Some of them do, but most of them don't. They belong to a segment, they have life event, it uses a channel to access an interaction point to describe a need that they have to get services and benefits. They're helped by government and service providers. They collaborate in activity, and then they get an integrated service offering. So I might simply say is I've turned, let's say for example I turned 65. Well, all of the government, all of the, you know, all of the government services from all the levels of government come over and say, congratulations, you're 65, here's your bundle of services from all of us. You're dealing with one-stop shopping. This is a very powerful model. This is the digital e-government of the future. This, by the way, came from 20, uh, 2006. It's still hits a lot, then you have to have this integrated delivery model. But this is one way of just illustrating some of the potentials of e-government, and you're going from that. Enterprise decision making, this is no surprise to most people, decision quality is terrible because they don't have decent information holdings. It's an absolute disaster in many cases. Information management perspectives, part of the problem with information is that you're dealing with various communities, you've got the library science, you've got records and archives, you've got programmers, you've got data scientists, you've got IM executives, and you've got stakeholders. So what you have to do is reconcile. It's more than just data in a database. This is one of the things too, is when you're dealing with the information, take a look at a holistic view of it. 
the rise of the chief DJ data or a digital officer. What is the issue? Why do we need a chief data officer if you have a chief information officer? Well, guess what? You got to now it's turning into the CTO, the chief knowledge officer, data officer, and they're basically separating their responsibilities into IT and information management. Now, you know, if you're dealing with IT, you sort of want to say is take a look at the definition of IT we put in the TOGAF 9 to avoid this problem. Doesn't seem to have made much of an impact. Life cycle management information related infor you know, and related information within an, uh, and technology within an organization. Sorry, that last one is technology. So the whole idea was to be information centric in the entire way that we're doing enterprise architecture for that. There's also lesson seven, which is show business advantages to the stakeholders. Prototype, prototype, prototype so they can visualize the capability, understand the possibilities and take get buy-in. Transilience is something called if you can't absorb change. We were trying to do major changes and we we're dealing with people that didn't have the educational background to have a clue as to what we were talking about. And in one nation, the presentation we could give it, when we changed nations, we had to give a different presentation because we we're dealing with different stakeholders. And this is one of the things you really have to understand is if you want to do a change, you have to make sure that the people have those skill sets in order to change. In both technology and management, e-government is not a technology problem. It's a business, it is an enterprise problem. I don't want to use the word business because that says business segment. It's an enterprise-wide problem that you have to take a look at. And you really have to have a, a combination of education and mindsets to take a look at the new capabilities in a business context. Now, let's take a look at Volivicante, okay? At the time, this was the state of the art. So the architecture, basically, the architect had to come up and said, how are we going to build this? This was, this was great. This was a, basically the prototype uh, for Versailles. You know, Fouquet have found out that you shouldn't compete with stuff, you know, when it comes down to Louis XIV, but that's another thing. So what happens, he had the conceptual view, and then he ended up having the logical view of how the pieces all fit together. Generally speaking, when you're putting your e-government together, keep architecture in place for that. This is an example, I'll just quickly go through it, of how you basically take a look at an oil spill up in the Canadian North and you get all the different government departments. They say, well, this is our part. This is what we do. This is how the resources have to be put together. And then you come up with the information outcome. Right decision, right time, right information. And you take a look at the foundation architecture. But you do this with the enterprise-wide view. And then you're dealing with how you share information between the various government departments. This is an illustration of the business scenario that comes right out of TOGAF. Okay, for that. So you take a look at that. The business scenario in context, you've got your corporate strategic objectives, you've got your business scenarios. That becomes part of your vision. You have use cases, which are based on your scenario, and you have your test cases, and then you have your um, learning cases, uh, your training cases as well. But you notice here, this doesn't vary much from the, from the previous one that I showed you from MIT that was put out as enterprise architecture strategy. It's where your business scenarios validate that the strategic objectives are doable, are feasible. And when you're dealing in the military, for example, we were dealing with multi-billion dollar projects, we ended up having you know, innovation facilities and environments where you just basically say, well, what works? We had a combination of subject matter experts, scientists, engineers, operations, research, and simulation. Simulation is a great tool. It's much underrated. Okay, and I know that virtual reality will be the way we will be shopping in the not too distant future. Use a synthetic environment. How many companies have a synthetic environment? It's not dissimilar to the skunk works that Lockheed had. This is something to take into consideration, but I've yet to see a government where they have a place, a simulated environment, where they could basically say, would this service be good? I mean, there's this whole part of the whole open government uh, type of uh, exercise. You've got to be opportunistic and be flexible. A plan as a common basis for change. That's the way you've got to look at an enterprise architecture. People talk about it being agile. Well, it's dynamic. I mean, it's always been that way. It just hasn't been implemented that way. Why too many reliability people? And they end up saying, the plan is the plan is the plan, we will follow the plan. Well, you, you know, you take a look at building blocks, that's a way of chunking out business value. And we did a case study in health where we essentially had various government departments. And we came out with ways, we just said one pagers, and we said, this is, these are the clients, this is the technology, the stakeholders trying to quantify what exactly was the issue, and also what solution was being put in place to resolve that. 
So this is part of your enterprise architecture. It was all business related. Technology was just one of the, one of the uh, items that was involved okay, for that. Lesson nine, the person with the gold makes the rules. Make sure that your enterprise architecture is in the right place. In the US federal enterprise architecture, enterprise architecture is part of planning and budgeting, and that's just the way, it'll, that's the way it should be uh, put in place. Because if you don't have control over the money, you can have the best architecture in the world, you're not going anywhere. Security and privacy, um, just in concluding, you're gonna have to have, it's often ignored until too late. I've just got tons of examples where they tried to fix it after the thing was fielded and cost 10 to, a, 10 to 100 times more to implement a security architecture, okay, for that. And when you're dealing with big data, the real challenge is that you're integrating social media, information systems, and critical uh, infrastructure through SCADA systems, control uh, systems. This is a major problem, a major challenge. You've got to make sure you architect for that. You don't want a person on a smartphone hacking into your water purification cap, uh, plant within a city. So you gotta make sure, also privacy, make sure you get it right. Privacy is becoming a major government concern. People give information and they should be the ones that control where it goes. So in conclusion, I would say is that one of the things for e-government we really have to take a look at is um, open standards. They're absolutely key. Uh, we've got to focus on information interoperability and standards such as the open data element framework that we have here within the, uh, within the open group are good ways and the enterprise architecture implementing these standards are good ways to move forward. Sharing information is, is difficult. We have also squeezing the technology social innovation gap. Normally we have technology, then we have social innovation. Enterprise architecture should be seen as a way of trying to get value out of these new technologies as quickly as possible. Okay, and that's sort of the, that's what it means. And time means money in government and private sector for that. IMIT skills for the future, they've been focused in the back on the, in the past on platform and infrastructure. They're gonna be up here in the knowledge enterprise environment, decision support analytics. Uh, right now, a lot of people are hiding their head. There was one CIO, he basically ended up spending all his new resources um, on people that were <clears throat> on infrastructure and platform rather than retraining people for analytics. Guess where those people are? The CIO group's being disbanded, okay, for that. So concluding, EA is a solid planning methodology. It's a management discipline. It's a business transformation methodology. And also, you know, it describes where you were, where you want to get. It's also an integrated framework. So it serves many purposes. EA works, just do it end to end. That's the main conclusion. So that's my question. So last thing I'll say is we're get together for the second e-government, another e-government conference, July 2017 in Ottawa.